be with you. Welcome to Faith Lutheran Church. Today is the 16th Sunday after Pentecost. Let me ask you my first existential question this morning. How is it that you became a Christian? More than likely, someone either brought you to church or invited you to come to church with them at some point. From that moment on, you heard, saw, and tasted the goodness of the Lord. And dare I say it, it changed your life forever. This morning we hear the story of someone else who went through all of that as an adult. He, too, was changed forever. Today, we give thanks for these life-changing moments. These are the matters we'll be pondering in our hearts and minds this morning. Oddly enough, there are no birthdays or anniversaries about which we know. Are we missing anyone this week? Okay. We're not going to sing happy birthday then. That's just how it is. Yeah. <laughs> Before we begin our service, of course, let's take a moment to greet each other by waving to each other. If you're comfortable, take a moment as well to wave to those watching the video. Please stand. <clears throat> All right. In the name of the Father and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. We join together in singing our opening hymn. Please be seated. Let us now make confession of our sins to God, our Heavenly Father. Merciful Father, we confess our sinfulness. We are not worthy for you to come among us. We are indeed sinful from our birth, and since that time have transgressed against you 
in thought, word, and deed. Our actions have brought injury to others. We have left undone those things which we ought to have done. We have done those things which we ought not to have done. We sincerely repent of our sins. Graciously hear this, our confession, O Lord, and grant us your grace and forgiveness in Jesus Christ. By the renewing work of the Holy Spirit within us, lead us to amend our sinful lives, that each day we may grow in righteousness and in hope to the glory of your holy name. My friends in Christ, Jesus, our Redeemer, and God's greatest gift, promises forgiveness, life, and salvation, and welcomes us to his table. As a called and ordained servant of Christ, and by his authority, I forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. As you believe, so may it be. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. For the peace from above and for our salvation, let us pray to the Lord. For the peace of the whole world, for the well-being of the Church of God, and for the unity of all, let us pray to the Lord. For this holy house, and for all who offer here their worship and praise, let us pray to the Lord. Help, save, comfort, and defend us, gracious Lord. be with you. Let us pray. Gracious God, as the holy angels called the world to rejoice when you first sent your only begotten Son to be born of the Virgin Mary, so help us to rejoice today in the comfort of the deliverance he brought when he gave his life to the world on the cross. Through the same Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. We hear God's word. The Old Testament reading for this Sunday is from Isaiah, the 35th chapter. 
Say to those who have an anxious heart, be strong, fear not. Behold, your God will come with vengeance, with the recompense of God. He will come and save you. Then the eyes of the blind shall be opened and the ears of the deaf unstopped. Then shall the lame man leap like a deer and the tongue of the mute sing for joy. For waters break forth in the wilderness and streams in the desert. The burning sand shall become a pool and a thirsty ground springs of water. This is the word of God. The epistle for this Sunday is from James, the second chapter. My brothers, show no partiality as you hold the faith in our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory. For if a man wearing a gold ring and fine clothes comes into your assembly, and a poor man in shabby clothing also comes in, and if you pay attention to the one who wears the fine clothes and say, you sit here in a good place, while you say to the poor man, you stand over there or sit down at my feet, have you not then made distinctions among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? Listen, my beloved brothers, has not God chosen those who are poor in the world to be rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom, which he has promised to those who love him? But you have dishonored the poor man. Are not the rich the ones who oppress you? and the ones who drag you into court? Are they not the ones who blaspheme the honorable name by which you were called? If you really fulfill the royal law according to the scripture, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. You are doing well. But if you show partiality, you are committing sin and are convicted by the law as transgressors. For whoever keeps the whole law but fails in one point shall become accountable for all of it. What good is it, my brothers, if someone says he has faith but does not have works? Can that faith save him? If a brother or sister is poorly clothed and lacking in daily food, and one of you says to them, go in peace, be warmed and filled, without giving them the things needed for the body, what good is that? So also faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. But someone will say, you have faith and I have works. Show me your faith apart from your works and I will show you my faith by my works. This is the word of the Lord. Please stand for the reading of the Gospel. The Holy Gospel according to St. Mark, the seventh chapter. From there, Jesus arose and went away to the region of Tyre and Sidon. He, and he entered a house and did not want anyone to know, yet he could not be hidden. But immediately, a woman whose little daughter was possessed by an unclean spirit heard of him and came and fell down at his feet. Now the woman was a Gentile, a Syrophoenician by birth, and she begged him to cast the demon out of her daughter. And he said to her, Let the children be fed first, for it is not right to take the children's bread and throw it to the dogs. But she answered him, Yes, Lord, yet even the dogs under the table eat the children's crumbs. And he said to her, For this statement, you may go your way. The demon has left your daughter. And she went home and found the child lying in bed and the demon gone. Then he returned from the region of Tyre and went through Sidon to the Sea of Galilee in the region of the Decapolis. And they brought to him a man who was deaf and had a speech impediment. And they begged him to lay his hand on him. And taking him aside from the crowd privately, he put his fingers into his ears, and after spitting, touched his tongue. And looking up to heaven, he sighed and said to him, Ephatha, that is, be opened. And his ears were opened, 
His tongue was released and he spoke plainly. And Jesus charged them to tell no one. But the more he, char the, but the more he charged them, the more zealously they proclaimed it. And they were astonished beyond measure, saying, He has done all things well. He even makes the deaf hear and the mute speak. This is the gospel of the Lord. Please be seated. We confess our Christian faith using the words of the Nicene Creed. I believe in... Please stand as we sing our sermon hymn.
Grace, mercy, and the peace of God be unto you in the name of Jesus, our Savior. Our text this morning is the gospel. Please be seated. So, existential question number two. Of course, I don't mean to insult your intelligence, but I feel like Cliff Clavin with what I'm going to say right now. Those of you who are of an age will remember the TV show's Cheers and Cliff the mailman who was a fountain of completely trivial and useless knowledge and would bore the tears out of the bar patrons. I feel like Cliff Claven right now by explaining the word exp um, existential to you. Only because it was a Lutheran pastor who coined the phrase. Some of you may have heard of Soren Kierkegaard. Um, the word existential is used a lot in today's world, especially after the pandemic. When we think of existential, it's the big questions of life that are overarching and sometimes filled with dread. That's what existential questions are. And if I insulted your intelligence, uh, please forgive me. So here's my next existential question. What would you do if a complete stranger came up to you this morning, stuck his or her fingers right in your ear, spat, and then touched your tongue. How would that make you feel? How would it make you feel if it was your friends that brought him or her to you? See the sense of dread I'm getting at here? Those people who brought this man to Jesus that morning or day probably were not expecting what happened to have happened. All they were really hoping for was that Jesus would place his hand on their friend and bless him. But no, Jesus goes and sticks his fingers in that man's ears and then spits on his tongue. Now, here's the connection from that time to this morning. In a similar way, Jesus would like to do that to each of us this morning. All he wants to do this morning is place his words into our ears in a similar way. He wants our tongues to be loosened so they can sing his praise and speak that praise as well. The one who does everything well wants all to get well with us this morning also. Now it's interesting, Mark being the shortest of the Gospels, and therefore the most brief and concise, tells us absolutely nothing about this guy. All we know is that he came from the region of the Decapolis, those ten cities out there in Gentile country. Ten towns known as one across the Sea of Galilee. You know, the kind of places that you wouldn't mention by name, but were grouped together because they were so insignificant. Ten towns known as one across the Sea of Galilee. Not the kind of a place you would expect a suitable anointed one, in other words, the Messiah, to show up. But then, of course, Jesus never really quite fits what people expect of that right proper Jewish Messiah. You'll recall, of course, that this Decapolis, what, where Jesus had cast out all those demons from the man that ran into a herd of pigs, which then ran off the cliff into the sea. Those people were not crazy about such things happening right in their own backyard. So they ensured Jesus and his band of disciples 
would leave forever. But of course, in the things of, in the course of time, word travels about Jesus and his power over demons and illness. And so when he shows up again in this area, there were people now who actually sought him out. And now, as Paul Harvey used to say, you know the rest of the story. That's how Jesus and this man met up. His friends believed enough about Jesus, so they brought their friend to Jesus. Today, we call that evangelism. We have all kinds of ways to do that. Pamphlets, committees, groups. When all is said and done, this is just bringing people you know and love to Jesus so he can bless them as you have been blessed. So, here Jesus uses a bit of sign language. He comes and meets this man where he is, acknowledging him in a personal way. He speaks his language, so to speak. Now he does something utterly bizarre. He takes his own fingers and sticks them directly into the man's ears. And then it, as if that's not enough, it gets even more bizarre. Jesus spits on his fingertips and then touches the man's tongue. The creator now touches this man where he is broken. The great physician is at work. He is literally hands-on, not in the distance and detached. Touch is critically important in this healing process. Those of you who are of an age will recall Mother Teresa. Maybe you've studied her in school. You know the work she did in Calcutta. Mother Teresa worked with the untouchables. In India, there was, and I, I think to this day, a little bit of that caste system still in place where there were different levels of membership in society. The untouchables were those with disease and poor. And when I say disease, Mother Teresa spent time with the most difficult people to be with. They may have had leprosy, they had diseases, and she would spend time with them. And not just spend time in conversation, but she would love them. She would love them by touching them, holding them, touching them for the first time in many cases, touching them for the first time in many years. She touched everyone she met. She always had one of her hands on someone's head or a shoulder, even as she fed them and bathed them. She touched the untouchables with her hands, the poor and the filthy and the diseased. Through her hands, she comforted and gave hope and healed in Jesus' name. Now, permit me the indulgence of going completely off script here. If I can, I want to bring in the epistle lesson this morning. It's all from the book of James. And it ended with, show me your works without, show me your faith without works is dead. Faith is really both. It's like a boat with two oars. Faith is one thing, but, <laughs> pardon me. I knew that was going to happen. So I have a thing. Here's what happened. 
I have one of those tile devices. I have to tell you what happened. It's a tile device so that if I lose my wallet, I know where it is. I can tap my phone and it'll ring and locate my wallet because I've done that. Me and Nathan have this thing. Okay, so now I've gone off script completely. Where was I? James. So the book of James is all about faith and works. Faith is like a, a, it's like a boat. And one oar is works, and the other is belief. You need both oars pulling in the same direction to get your faith going. So it's belief on the one hand, and works on the other. Mother Teresa did these works of faith. She didn't just talk about faith, she touched people with her faith. The book of James is written by James, who may have been a half-brother of Jesus, who was a pastor. And in his church, I love this, in his church, there were several different groups of people. And one day, as we can surmise from the book of James, somebody walks into the church that was not really from the church per se. We surmise it because he uses this as an example to tell his congregation, look, you can't show partiality. Somebody walks in and he uses the word shabby. Walks in. You can't show partiality. You just can't. Don't, he says. And then he talks further about faith and works. And it's one thing to talk about faith on a Sunday morning, but what do you do Monday to Friday? Or Monday to Saturday? Your faith Sunday morning should reflect your faith on a Friday night, or a Tuesday afternoon, or even on a Sunday morning. And he says, this, this isn't right. The banner here, grace, the just shall live by faith. We live by faith, but faith is also doing things that reflect our faith. So James makes a big deal of showing no partiality. We love because God first loved us. All right, end of sidebar. Let me come back. Mother Teresa touched people. Jesus touches people. They were touched by God's hands. God is a hands-on God. How do we know that? He didn't just talk for 1,800 years about the Savior coming. That's what the Old Testament is about. The New Testament, the Gospels in particular, are about Jesus becoming God with flesh on so that he could touch people. He stepped down from his glory in heaven and then became enfleshed with our flesh and dwelt among us and touched us through his own humanity. There are have even been hymns written about that. He touched me, is one of those. And then became enfleshed in our flesh, dwelt among us, and touched us through his own humanity. God with flesh on the same kind of fingernails we used to tell the boys that you have, the same kind of hair that most of you have. Ear poking fingers. Spitting on and then grabbing tongues. He is the God who interacts with us as the human creation that we are. We don't talk about an out of body or spiritual gobbledygook prattled about today in so many places. Nope. It's not like that. God chose to deal with us in the grimy, mundane, unpretentious, earthy, ordinary way of human life. The very fingers of God were poked in that man's ears. God touched that man's tongue with his own in Jesus. You know what that tells us? He knows the depth 
of your human brokenness and mine too. And what price he is going to have to pay to restore us back to himself. He knows precisely the cost of this healing. It was his cross and his death. He knows our own suffering and pain and mourning in our own sorrow. The kind that you feel when someone you've spent your whole life with passes away. Or a child dies. Or you hear the grim news that you have cancer or someone you know has cancer. He knows that kind of pain. He knows your faults and he knows mine too. And he listens to the groans of our days and yes, our nights. And then groans for us because they are the same groanings which the Holy Spirit prays for us in our time of frailty. Now and at last, Jesus says something. Mark says it in Aramaic, the language, which is a dialogue of Hebrew, that is spoken by Jesus. Ephetha, which being translated means be opened. Be released. He wasn't just talk, speaking about that man's ears. He was speaking to all of him. Be freed from your captivity to sin. My friends in Christ, the Word of God is living and it is active. Spirit and it is life. These are not dead words that are found in the Scriptures. They are alive for us in life. These words fall on ears that were deaf and now causes them to hear. <coughs> These words fall on ears that were deaf and now causes them to hear. Mute tongues are that... Sorry, mute tongues are what those words fell on. But now he causes them to speak. With that one word, Ephetha, Jesus causes that main name to hear. That man, sorry, to hear. And this tongue is freed. And now he speaks plainly and with clarity. The gospel writer doesn't tell us what he said. As always, the attention is on Jesus not on the miracles or even their recipients. All we know now is that he spoke in an understandable way and with articulation. His ears were open, his tongue was loosed. God came in Christ. He came to take upon himself our own illness in his own body, to battle every demon that plagues us and makes our lives dim and takes upon himself every wreckage that crushes us. From all that binds us, he comes to free us, that keeps us captive, that hinders us from being the free children of God, he now makes us. He came to unfetter us from sin, death, and Satan. He has done all things well, they said. He even makes the deaf hear and the mute speak. We have even more to say about Jesus than they did. Greater things even than making ears and tongues work again. He died for us, rose from the dead for us, and he reigns for all over us. His victory over our own sin and death is lorded over those in his death and resurrection. Now, my friends, that's something to celebrate. And I ask the question, how did you come to faith? You all know the answer. In your baptism, of course. Maybe it was a trick question. He says, Ephetha, to us on the day of our baptism. Our ears have been poked and ready to hear his word. He has anointed our own tongues to sing praises to him, to pray to him and to proclaim that he is the Lord of all. He now still puts into our ears his forgiveness, his body and blood in our mouths and on our tongues, his word into our minds and hearts, in the very same in the flesh way of fingers into our ears and spit on our tongues. We are born deaf to God's word. Our muteness is from birth as we can't pray, praise, and give thanks. But out of his grace, someone at some point 
took us to Jesus. Someone ensured we were carried to our baptism. Someone taught us God's word. Someone invited us to church to hear it. Someone stuck the gospel of Jesus in our ears. Maybe it was a parent, a pastor, a friend, a teacher. He's the one who opens ears. He's the one who loosens tongues. He's the one who forgives sinners. He's the one who raises the dead. He's the one who gives eternal life. He's the one who does everything well. He's the one you can trust to do everything well with and for you in Christ. Amen. And now the peace of God that passes all understanding will guard and keep your hearts and minds in him forever. Amen. Please stand as we sing the offertory. Please be seated. Let us pray for the whole church of God in Christ Jesus and for all people according to their needs. Heavenly Father, by your spirit, open our deaf ears to hear your word, that our tongues would be released to proclaim with zeal how your Son has done all things well. Lord, in your mercy. Gracious God, you have commanded your church to take the word of life to the ends of the earth. Strengthen and support all who travel to foreign lands on behalf of the church's mission. Give them wisdom and courage as they tell others about Christ. Bless their hearers with hearts that are receptive to your gifts. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. Heavenly Father, we place our hope in you and ask your blessing on our Prime Minister, Justin Trudeau our Canadian Federal Parliament, our Premier Scott Moe, our Saskatchewan Provincial Legislative Assembly, and all provincial assemblies, our Mayor Charlie Clark, and our Saskatoon Municipal Government, and all in authority, that their plans would be ordered for the welfare of those who govern, of those they govern, and that you would execute your justice for the oppressed. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. Heavenly Father, give us a humble and urgent faith that would beg even for crumbs from your son's table, that as your children we may receive the fullness of the feast he gives to us in his body and blood. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. Heavenly Father, create and sustain in us a lively faith in Christ Jesus, and lead us by your spirit to be active in all good works. Lord, in your mercy. Dear Lord, in the midst of their daily tasks, our farmers often depend on machinery and equipment. We pray for your divine protection over these vital tools of their trade. Safeguard them against malfunctions and accidents and guide our farmers' hands as they operate these complex mechanisms with skill and caution, may their work be conducted in safety and with unwavering confidence in your watchful presence, especially at this harvest time. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. Heavenly Father, graciously behold the sick and those in any need. And here we remember Del Wazilowicz, Warren Sass, 
Cesar Capronzai, Elsa Schmeling, Barry Hembroff, and those we now name in our own hearts. Lord, in your mercy, gracious God, we pray for all persons suffering from war. May they be held in your loving care and protection and given the strength to endure great suffering and hardship. Transform the hearts and minds of all those who perpetuate violence, oppression, and war. Grant wisdom to world leaders in advancing efforts toward world peace. May they not be compromised by self-interest and blind indifference. Lord, in your mercy, Heavenly Father, source of all life and life that never ends, receive our prayers this day in the name of your beloved Son, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. We hear the musical offertory. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is truly good, right, and salutary that we should at all times and in all places give thanks to you, O Lord, Holy Father, almighty and everlasting God. For in your great mercy you have come among us in Jesus, our Master and our Friend whose death brings us forgiveness of sins, 
new life and the promise of endless rejoicing in your presence. Because he is now risen from the dead and lives and reigns to all eternity, all who believe in him will overcome sin and death and will rise again to life everlasting in your heavenly kingdom. Therefore, with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven, we laud and magnify your glorious name, evermore praising you and saying... Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom. Our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, on the same night when he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to them, saying, Take and eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way also, he took the cup after supper. And when he had given thanks, he gave it to his disciples and said, Take and drink, all of you. This cup is the New Testament in my blood, which is given and shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. We join together in singing the Annus Day. would like to receive communion in the pew and you're more comfortable with that, please let us know by raising your hand and our distributors will come and bring it to you.
has forgiven you. Go and serve him in joy and peace. Amen. Now may the true body and blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ strengthen and preserve you in true faith to life everlasting, imparting joy and peace. Now may the true body and blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ strengthen and preserve you in true faith to life everlasting. Jesus Christ. 
Christ strengthen and preserve you in true faith and to life everlasting. Depart in joy and peace. Please stand. <clears throat> we join together in the Nunc Dimittis. Let us pray. We give thanks to you, Almighty God, that you have refreshed us through this salutary gift. And we implore you that of your mercy, you would strengthen us through the same in faith toward you and in fervent love toward one another. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Receive now the benediction. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and grant you his peace. Amen. We join together in the closing hymn, Alibere.
Please be seated. Once again, thank you for being with us in worship, and thank you to those who have taken the time to watch the video. Lots of announcements in the bulletin. I'm going to touch on a couple of them in a moment. If you're visiting with us this morning, um, and you'd like to get together for a visit with me, I'd love that. Uh, we have a way that you can provide confidential contact information. All you need to do is place your name and whatever contact information you want to leave on the white communion registration card that's in the pew. And then you can just place it in the offering plate as you leave. The only people that see it are our administrative assistant, Donna Iris Clark, and myself, just so that you know. Um, or you can sign the guest book as well. Just a couple of things to remind you, this coming Saturday, our service of remembrance at Trinity Halton Cemetery is happening. That's Saturday, September 14th at 11 a.m. There are details on what to bring in the bulletin, etc. Also, the Joy Circle Bible Study will be starting shortly. Please check the um, bulletin for details. Um, the Luminos AGM is today at 7 p.m. at Rock of Ages Lutheran Church. And there's information in the bulletin there as well. All right, anything else that needs to be announced? All right, I would say go riders, but it seems like they're already gone. <laughs> All right, go in peace. <laughs>